Hi, this is Bob Dunham, founder of the Institute for Generative Leadership. Welcome back to our conversation of exploring leadership and your leadership, how you create the future and how you can create the future. And in this step of our journey, we're going to see the non-discretionary, essential structure of the coordination of action. Because it's not simply enough to do more, right? We have to do more together. And so this is a place that's been a blind spot in our mainstream education and our mainstream thinking. So uh, if we look here, the kind of shift we're making is comparable to a shift of understanding from, uh, if we take a historical example, from alchemy to chemistry. You know, alchemy did some good things. I mean, we, we, we could heal certain things and we could make butter and beer and other good things like that. But it didn't have the fundamental structure to really understand how to take action. It, it was a new world to go to chemistry. And so we're going to do this in the coordination of action. So if we look here, I'm going to show you certain kinds of conversations. And one question for you is, do you have these conversations? Are they familiar? Are they working for you? Because the ones we're going to look at are essential. So let's begin. Let me show you four different categories, five actually, if we go to the unknown, of conversations that are essential domains of action for us as leaders, uh, for us as professionals, for us as team leaders, team members, uh, members of families, communities. These are the conversations where we create the future and make them happen. So let's begin. If we look, this, this first inner circle represents the conversations we have that produce action, or that don't. It's the action space. How effective are you, your team, your company, your organization, your community in producing the action you're looking for to create the future that you care about? And so <clears throat> this is action, but based on what we learned in our last step, these are the conversations that generate action. Remember, conversations are not just descriptive. They generate when we are going to take action, how we think about it, how we formulate it, happens in a conversation. How we articulate it, how we initiate it, how we negotiate it, how we coordinate it, how we evaluate it, all happens in conversation. And it's unavoidable. These are not techniques. These are not discretionary. There is a structure here. That's what we're looking to do. Just like uh, uh, when we go from alchemy to chemistry, we need to see the essential structure. Now, I want to make a comment here about structure. Some people have a reaction that, oh, I'm going to be constrained by a structure. But if we look, the natural structure, the essential structure, doesn't constrain, it enables. You have a skeleton. You have lungs. You have a heart. We don't complain about these things. They are a structure that we live in. They are unavoidable. And if we learn to take care of them, they enable us. The fact that you have a skeleton doesn't limit where you go, what you do with it. So there's a structure to conversation that enables a healthy domain of action. And then what you do with it, you get to, you get to decide where you're going to go and why you're going to go there in those conversations. Now, if we look here in this diagram, there's a little black dot. And I use this black dot to think about the mainstream common sense about action, which is about tasks and doing, that external action in the world where we're leaving out the internal state of human beings. We're leaving out the coordination with each other. And that's where we can get trapped, where it's about tasks and doing and completion. That's where we find exhaustion, where we don't find possibility. It's too small a space. That's the old world. We're expanding into the new world. But there are more conversations in action. When we go beyond action, we also have another space, the space of possibility. And the conversations for possibility are where we invent them, not just see what's possible based on our past experience. That's where we have the power of entre entrepreneurship, creativity, uh, innovation, comes from this kind of conversation. And <clears throat> there's a third kind of conversation that is rarely spoken about, and yet it's crucial to how we move in our action and in our space of possibilities. See, these are the conversations of context. 
rarely spoken about, but it's the distinctions that we see the world from. It is the menu of actions available to us. And if we're really going to go from an old world to a new world, we have to create a new context. The conversation I'm having with you is that kind of conversation. A new context, new distinction, what do we see, what do we pay attention to, so that we can have new possibilities and new actions to fulfill them. And there's another dimension here that is essential for leadership. It's called the unknown. The unknown is a real challenge in our culture. We are trained to know what to do, to know how to do things. And when we run into not knowing, most people say, I don't know what to do. It stops me. But the kind of generative leadership we're talking about, not knowing is the starting point of action. It's a domain of skill. We begin to do many different kinds of things. It's where we start action, not stop it. The unknown is a space of possibility. How do we explore that space of possibility? We inquire, we explore, we experiment, we do prototypes. There's all kinds of ways that the unknown doesn't need to stop us. And that's one of the crucial dimensions of generative leadership that uh, we have found that is not part of our, our common sense. So if we look at these kinds of conversations, I want to focus in on the conversation for action and really show some of this hands-on, pragmatic structure that is now really fulfilling the, uh, the interpretation of language being generative. That it's not simply describing action, it's making it happen. So in this, this conversation, we call it uh, the conversation for action. What is the conversation that produces action? So when we start action, the conversation, the move in it, not the word you use, but the kind of move you make is to ask someone else to do something. It's a request. Sounds simple. And yet, when I was first introduced to this, I looked at my own behavior and the organization around me, and I saw so many places where we were dissatisfied, uh, struggling, and there was no request. Why? The biggest enemy we have in the organizational uh, shared social space is resignation. We don't even speak. So learning to make requests, and there is a structure, an anatomy to requests that we go into more deeply in our programs of how to do it, how to listen to it, how to make sure it's landing effectively for the other person. Because remember, effective communication is not about what you say, it's how you are listened to after you speak. That's the real skill. And again, another blind spot in our culture. Why do we make requests? We make them to get agreements, to get what we call promises. And when you're asking for someone to do something, you're asking them to, to promise you want to trust them. So one of the skills of this kind of action generative uh, coordination of action with others is to assess the trustworthiness of the agreements of the statements that other people make. I uh, began my journey in this organization that I shared with you before that was dysfunctional and couldn't coordinate and it's because everybody said yes. And what I discovered was saying yes doesn't make you doesn't mean you've made a promise. Doesn't mean you have an agreement. You need to listen beyond the words to see what is really being spoken. And that includes dimensions we're going to talk about even even more deeply later about emotions and body. They are part of the the, the performance art of communication and coordination. But when we begin to Ask someone to do something. Hey, take out the garbage. Oh yeah, sure, I'll get to it. That, no, you could listen to the commitment there. Uh, and this is something that is one of those aspects of our blind spot of coordination. It's something that we're already doing that we haven't noticed the power of, so we don't bring it when we really need it. So if, if we make an agreement that you're going to come over for dinner, we've changed the future. I'm actually going to take action based on that agreement. I'm going to go shopping, I'm going to clean the house, I'm going to get ready to have a guest at dinner. That has changed the future, that has changed my action, and it'll change the result. That wouldn't happen without that conversation. And if you don't show up, we have that issue of trust arising. Well, am I going to invite you again? Uh, how do we do it? You, and you can see how that plays out in our organizational life. So we have roles that we take that require some actions and skills to have this conversation work. 
The conversation actually demands these roles. One is a role we call being a customer. Customer is a, a word we use not because you have money to buy something, but because you're a customer for your request. You're asking someone to do something and you want to be satisfied. You're a customer to get satisfied, to find some customer satisfaction. That's why we use that terminology. The person who's being asked to perform, we call a performer. So my question to you is, where you find the satisfaction, are you making the requests that need to be made? Are you getting the promises that need to be made in order for that dissatisfaction to turn into action and satisfaction? And what are we asking for? Our terminology for that is a condition of satisfaction. Now I'm using new terminology here because we're going into new territory. We can't understand this new world in the old vocabulary, in the old actions. We actually are developing new eyes here, but at the same time, if you're following me, you're going to see that everything I'm saying begins to show up. We begin to have a new obviousness show up with this new set of interpretations that are revealing the world to us. So what is action about? It's always about producing satisfaction in a person. If you have action that's not producing satisfaction, it's not valuable. If you're, if you're taking action that's not going to satisfy anybody, it's a waste. And so that's a, a very powerful way to look at what is going on in our coordination of action. We have some other phases here in, the, in the, the coordination of action. If we have an agreement, we go to execution, and then we go to satisfaction. So this conversation has more to learn, more to practice, but this is something that you can begin to do now. You can look and see, is there missing requests around me? Are there missing promises around me? And this, this question allows us to be generative because I can make a request. I can, I can make an offer or a promise to someone. I can, I can make things happen. So if we look at this structure of coordination, which I have shared with you after our 30 plus years, we've never found an exception. These structures of conversation are going on whether you're aware of them or not. And so those phases I talked about can be, can be unpacked into a straight line here. And here's where we have that request. Here's where we have the promise. Here's the point where we reach completion. Here's where we have satisfaction or dissatisfaction. This is where we negotiate after the request. This is where we formulate before the request. Here's where we execute after the agreement. Uh, here's where we evaluate after completion. And here's where we learn. This is something that when we practice, we begin to see that those aspects are already going on. We want to see them. We want to do them better. How does this apply to the everyday action you take? It's conversations. It's listening. It's making a request, negotiating, and executing, this is the way coordination shows up. Do you want to create a more valuable future? Do you want to advance your career? Then we need to learn to make bigger promises. We need to formulate new possibilities, new conditions of satisfaction, and coordinate uh, conversations with other people to make them happen. This is the essence of leadership and management. So there is some structure here. We call this anatomy. Why? It's biological. This is human beings, not machines, talking to each other. And it has some dimensions of our biology, of emotions and language and body that I want to share with you more in our next video and really talk about how do we produce skill? How do we produce the learning where these kinds of interpretations really become action, actionable and producing results? In fact, we begin to see how to walk a path to mastery, to better take care of what you care about in the world with action and results. So see you, see you in the next step of our conversation. Bye-bye.